Psalm 66 is what we'll be looking at tonight. I'm always thankful every time I get to speak to the Lord's people, uh, whether it be Sunday school in the morning uh, or here Wednesday night. It's, it's always an honor, and I realize uh, how great of a privilege it is. So I'm thankful to be able to share the word with uh, my, ch- my family here. So Psalm 66, just uh, a quick, quick look at the uh, overall theme of Psalm 66. It's a psalm of praise. And really, as you read through the psalm, you can feel the joy uh, this man is experiencing, and you can see the reverence he has for the Lord. <clears throat> the psalm seems to imply that the man uh, was in some sort of trouble, probably uh, persecution at the hands of an enemy. That's a common theme in the psalms that you, that you see. And the worship and praise that you see here are connected to an answer to prayer. You can see in verse 20, in verse, eight, uh, in verse 16, he says, Come and let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. So the man is rejoicing, and he's rejoicing greatly. And in his rejoicing, he's calling others to come and rejoice in the Lord with him. So he's, he's praising God publicly for the way God works in his people's lives and also his mighty power over their enemies. It, it's a truth to say that when God's people behold God's glory in his awesome deeds, their hearts will respond with joyous worship. This kind of worship makes his praise glorious. And that's what we've come here to do tonight. That's what we come here and gather for every time, to rejoice in the glory of the Lord and his awesome deeds and the things he's done for us. So just a a, a quick three points of the outline. Point number one, come and rejoice in the glory of the Lord. That's verses one through four. Point number two, come and see the glory of the Lord. It's really verses five through 12. And the last point, come and hear the glory of the Lord. Verses 13 through verses 20. I'll read the first four verses. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. So you can really see it's, uh, it starts off with a call to rejoice, a call to sing the glory of his name. And I'm just going to really focus on the singing part here because the next point focuses on the awesome deeds also. And uh, you can really just see that he's very enthusiastic here. The words that he uses, shout, sing, make his praise glorious, say to God. <clears throat> So it's, it's, uh, it's very good to come together and, and sing the songs, like what we just uh, were able to do together. It's, it's really a wonderful thing um, to come together and sing about all that God is, all his goodness, all his greatness, all that his name represents. And uh, when you think about it, as you go through scripture, singing is really one of the most powerful and glorious ways to praise God together. When, when you see people wanting to make God's name great coming together, they're always singing songs. I mean, in heaven, you see them singing songs. Um, on earth, they're singing psalms. They're praising God, and that's, that makes God's praise glorious. <clears throat> this is not to make little of any other form of praise, obviously, but singing is, is, a, is an awesome way to praise God together. So that, that just uh, makes me want to encourage uh, the members of the choir, who I think are returning next week, um, 
it's an awesome thing to sing to the Lord together. Members of the congregation, um, each week, each night that we come together, it's, it's an awesome thing uh, to sing to the Lord. Um, for the people who play the instruments as well, it's, it's an awesome deed that, that you are doing. So I would encourage us to really uh, think hard on our singing and take our singing very seriously and, and think of those heavenly assemblies praising God in song when we sing. Think of those people gathered together praising God uh, when we sing. The second part of verse 2, after sing the glory of his name, is, is make his praise glorious. You think about... Uh, what it means, let me just use a, just a, an illustration of how the world makes things glorious, just to give you an idea of what we're saying here. Um, sports, we'll use a, a sports example. Let's use the Super Bowl, for example. Um, they know how to make that television show a big deal. They go all out. They hold nothing back. They want you to know how important this event is. Uh, when the trophy is handed out, the confetti is coming down, they're saying, this is a big deal. Uh, see how important this is. And we, can, we do that, too, in things, um, big events in our lives. Uh, we make weddings a big deal. We make birthdays a big deal. Uh, things that we're passionate about, we make a big deal. And it's only fitting, naturally, that when we come together, that the majestic glory receive praise and honor worthy of his name. Songs of praise should be made glorious by the worshipers. So what I'm not saying is I'm not saying um, that, you know, you, you get the lights and you get the smoke and you get the fog and that's the way to make it glorious. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that uh, don't hold back when you sing. Don't hold back. Um, be passionate about it. Let it be so that if someone who is not from the body of Christ comes into the church, they can say, wow, these people place a lot of value on their God, and we can tell by their singing. We come together to rejoice in the glory of the Lord. Next point, uh, verses 5 through 7. I'll just read this part first because I'll make a point in this and then I'll move to the next part. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. So just a few thoughts about these verses here, and you can kind of see that he's uh, drawing on the past awesome deeds of God to highlight about what he's about to say about the awesome deeds that God has done in his own life. Uh, so these verses give us an example of God's past awesome deeds and delivering his people and God's power over the enemy in them. <clears throat> we come together, we, we come and see what God has done. Uh, for example, in, in preaching the word, uh, every time we come together, we are looking at the revealed word of God in his holy scriptures, his past awesome deeds, and we're beholding his glory um, in singing. Singing is meant to teach as well. Our Sunday school teaching public scripture reading. I'm thankful that we um, are doing public scripture reading more in, in our worship services. I, I really enjoy that. I like reading God's word as a congregation together, um, even in praying. The psalmists often focus on their great deliverance. Israel did this a lot, and their deliverance from Israel, their deliverance at the Red Sea, through, through, through the, uh, the wilderness. It's always a focal point. It's always something that they go back to uh, when they want to rejoice in God, when they're having times uh, that are hard and struggling, just as the truths of the gospel are for us. Um, we always set our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and what he's done for us in our great deliverance. We know that just to think about the word who was with God and was God, who created all things and became flesh, that he might deliver us from our bondage to sin and set us free that we might worship him. That's something that we daily focus on and, and daily set our hope in uh, uh, to see the Lord, to be with the Lord. <clears throat> this raises a good point as well. Um, we're talking about seeing the glory of the Lord, and um, it's easy to glory in God's mercy when we think about the gospel message. Uh, it's easy to glory in his compassion and his love in his deliverance. But it, right here in verse 7, um, it also shows the psalmist glorying in uh, how God displays his justice through judgment. Because he says they pass through the waters on foot. Uh, if we remember, they weren't the only group of people who tried to pass through the waters. Israel sang a whole song about that right after they crossed the Red Sea, praising God for his judgment. <clears throat> I understand that we struggle uh, with this, this part of God, um, this part of his glory, because we look around and we see pain, emotionally hurting people, uh, crime, death, and things like this. Uh, we also struggle with uh, loved ones that we see and we know who don't know the Lord struggle with that now. It's, it's hard for us to deal with. Uh, we see a, a world of sinners running headfirst into destruction because they believe it's best for them. And it hurts, and it should. It should. That's not how God first ordained it, and that's not how he will let it continue. But this is, this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. I want us to have a, a, a good view of the glory of God because we uh, glory, sing the praises of his name, all that he is. Uh, you can't get very far in the book of Psalms without seeing the psalmist exulting in the holy justice of God all the way through. And it's, it's just, it's really a pattern in scripture. <clears throat> it's really a pattern in scripture. And I'll just read just a few verses because it's, it's good for us to glory in, in this part of, <clears throat> it's good for us to make much of all that the Lord is. Psalm 7, let the assembled peoples gather around you. Psalm 7, verse 6, I'm sorry. Arise, Lord, in your anger. Rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God, decree justice. Let the Lord judge the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to your righteousness. <clears throat> My shield is God most high, who saves the upright in, upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. Uh, Psalm 9, 4. For you have upheld my right cause, my right and my cause, sitting enthroned as the righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken my enemies. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equity. It's good for us to glory in, in all that the Lord is, even the things that, that are hard for us to understand now. <clears throat> even for the things that are hard for us to understand now. <clears throat> think about it um, Romans 9 even tells us that the lake of fire will abound make much of God's mercy that he has granted to vessels prepared for glory hard thing for us to deal with now but not something that we should diminish in worship. We make much of all that God is, all of his glory. We praise the Lord for his just judgments. 
including the just judgment of the rebellious. <clears throat> Come and see his power in the trials of his people. Verses 8 through 12. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. <clears throat> I always, I love reading through these kinds of scriptures. I love reading through these kinds of scriptures. They build my heart up so much. I started to write out the Psalms by hand um, around the beginning, middle of January. And it's been such a help for me, such a help for me. And this is where I ended up, Psalm 66, right here. The last Psalm that I wrote out. One of the things David wrestles with a lot in the Psalms is the prosperity of the wicked and the suffering of the righteous because it seemed contrary to the law and to the covenant. He knows God gives to every man according to the works of his own hands, but he, he looks around and is confounded, thinking why. <clears throat> I think of this right here. It's, he's looking back on Egypt again, and he says there was a purpose in that. There was a purpose in that time. You know, we can look around on, on the conditions in the world today. Um, let's just take the recent events of uh, the homosexual marriage being made law and uh, possible persecution on the church that comes from that. God has a purpose in that for his church. He has a purpose in that. If persecution does come on the church because of that, he has a purpose. God rules over his enemies. He rules over his enemies. Even, even when they bring us into prison and they lay burdens on our backs and they ride over our heads, God has a purpose in it. He says, you refined us. And we all know what it means to refine a precious metal. You have to heat it up and put it on the fire to separate the impurities from the pure metal. <clears throat> And what you get is a purified vessel. That's the way our suffering and trials are described in scripture all the time. All the time. And it's not easy to think of it like that as we're going through our troubles. I'm sure all those years of slavery in Egypt, they weren't uh, the most joyous time for the Israelites. They were hard years, hard years of, of hard slavery. And he says, you've tested us. You will find us like silver. So we see that the Lord allowed the enemy to crush his people for a while, but only so he might accomplish his purposes in it. So the enemies that the church has in the world, they really only serve a purpose for the Lord, even in their rebellion, even in their rebellion. <clears throat> and I can't help but think that... Uh, We've been going through some hard times here as, as a church family. As individuals here in our assembly, uh, we've been going through some hard times. And it just is really encouraging to think about uh, the Lord is just making us a little bit purer, a little shinier, our faith. And you know what? This, this is really a time to be thankful to be a part of this body of believers. Um, I'm thankful the Lord placed me here. I'm thankful I'm still here. Because if I wasn't here, the Lord wouldn't be doing in my faith what he is doing. And that's the same for every individual here. Uh, good reason to stay and endure through this time because the Lord will do some mighty thing in your faith, uh, and I can say he has done it in mine, and I'm sure he's done it in yours. Uh, this will benefit us 
greatly, all the things that we are going through. <clears throat> so we see God's glory in suffering, even. Suffering is not easy. Jesus, Jesus struggled in his suffering. Jesus even struggled in his suffering. Romans 5, 3 says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces, and he goes on down the list to say, hope at the end. Uh, James 1, 2, and 3, he says, consider it pure joy when he talks about trials of many kinds, and it comes down to this end that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. First Peter I didn't write the verse down, I'm sorry. It says, in all this, you, I think it's 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In all this you greatly rejoice, though, for now, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It's an awesome thing to know as a child of God that all the rebellion in the world, all the suffering in the world, all the trials in the world, all the pain that we suffer can only accomplish the fruit that God desires in us. That is, that is an awesome thing. Praise, praise the Lord uh, for his glory in trials. <clears throat> okay, lastly, come. Hear of the glory of the Lord. And I even added, in the worship and praise of his people. Because really, this is what you see here in the last part. Verse 13 through 20. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice fat animals to you and an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. So you can see what the rest of this song flows. The rest of this psalm flows out of is this right here. God has revealed his love for this man. Now he will go and reflect that love and worship. Come, come and see what God has done for me. Let me call others to come alongside and praise God with me because he's awesome in his deeds to ma in, for mankind. One thing that, that really uh, caught my attention the first time I walked in Berea uh, was reverent worship. When I, when I walked through the doors, uh, um, I had been to a few churches, but really my first time coming into church, I walked in and I saw the worship of the people, and I just walked out, and I was like, wow, those people love the Lord. This is the place for me. This is the place for me. Reverent, faithful worship. People can come and see the glory of the Lord and the worth of God in the worship of his people. Every time somebody from outside of the church, walks through those doors and comes and, and, and partakes in a worship service with us, they're beholding the glory of the Lord. They see our response to God. They see our rejoicing in the Lord. That's a beautiful thing. Come in here, he says. Come in here. Um, this is this is great encouragement also for us. In, in uh, not they're not small things, but Sunday night, we have a time to stand up and we have a time to praise the Lord with our lips in front of His people. Praise God together. And it, I know sometimes myself, I probably should praise God more often. There. Are, are plenty of things that God uh, deserves to receive praise for that I probably withhold. But again, public praise, publicly praise him with our lips in our testimony time, in our praise time, and in our prayer time. 
so I, I, again, when I look at this psalm, I think about it in, in that context, apply it to our life, and I just think that if we can't come together and rejoice in the glory of God, then we either need to adjust our view of God or we need to deal with some sin in our heart. When you think about most of the world being blind to the glory of God, they can't see it. In fact, Romans 1, verse 18, tells us they actually withhold the knowledge of God by doing sin and working hard at it. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They work hard at sin so they don't have to acknowledge the truth that can be known about God. And we can see the glory of God. We can come in here and rejoice and worship God. So there's my encouragement to come, to see, and to hear, and rejoice in the great glory of our God.